Joshua chapter 6, if you'll turn there, please. Joshua chapter number 6. Today's the Super Bowl. I want to mention something to you about the coin toss. A little research. Heads or tails? The biggest sporting event of the United States each year begins with a simple question. Heads or tails? The coin toss is an NFL Super Bowl staple, if you will. However, this ritual has had major impacts both on the field and in the sporting books. Uh, many of you may not know that that is a, a big betting issue. When people bet on anything, of what, whether it's going to be heads or tails, millions of people bet on what the coin toss is going to be. Out of 57 Super Bowls played thus far, 26 teams have won the coin toss and the game. In fact, there's been a trend going uh, on, on prior to last year, each team to win the coin toss for the last eight years has lost the game. Each team in the last eight years to win the coin toss has lost game. Matter of fact, the last team to win the coin toss and win the game was in 2014. That would have been the Seattle Seahawks. They're not playing today, just so you know. <laughs> Many today believe that eternal life, if there is such a thing, is simply a coin toss. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, the lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. There's going to be 68,000 people sitting in Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas today and some 110 million people worldwide watching this contest. But can I remind you today that the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, even today, and the angels rejoice over one sinner that repents, more so than anything that happens in a ball game. And a coin toss does not decide a man's eternity. That's, dis that's determined by what we do with Jesus Christ. 10 years from now, there'll be very few people that remember who won this particular game today. But in eternity, we will be rejoicing for one simple truth, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation is not found by chance like a coin toss. It's found in a choice. Today is the day of salvation. As far as the game is concerned, and I love football as much as the next guy, I love a good game. Uh, my motto has been throughout the last couple weeks is, is go 49ers, no more Taylor Swift. It's just, <laughs> we're done, we're done. Okay? And I'm done with that. Joshua 6, look at verse 16, the Super Bowl, they say, is a, is a battle of the best teams, and today I want to bring a message titled, A Legendary Battle. Joshua chapter 6, look at verse 16, and as you're turning there, I'm going to ask two things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to do the best you can to follow with me as I read through the text. I'm probably going to read a few more verses than I normally do in, my, in, my, in a morning message, uh, but, but I want to lay the foundation for this. So number one, do the best you can. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. Use that, open it up, go to Joshua 6, and follow along. Picture the story in your mind's eye and see if you can discipline yourself not to wander but to focus and, and see uh, as it chronicles uh, what takes place in our uh, passage here today. And so that's the first request. The second request is when you're looking at your notes, I actually thought about not even doing notes today on a handout because you're going to be looking at when I'm going to get to point one. My, note, my, my points are super fast. The bulk of the message is in the introduction, which is different for me, but I'm going to share that with you. So just disregard those uh, for about an hour and then we'll jump into those in a minute. <laughs> Look at Joshua chapter 6, look at verse 16. And it came to pass that at the seventh time, 
When the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So just a little background here. This is the children of Israel going into Jericho. God did a miraculous thing and gave them the victory at Jericho. Verse 17, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Verse 19, but all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron are consecrated unto the Lord. I wrote, I underlined that in my Bible, unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So look up here for just a minute. Basically, God is saying here, don't touch anything, okay? That doesn't belong to you. It's to go into the treasury. The spoils are not yours. Keep reading, verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they took the city. So God wrought a great victory. The walls of Jericho fell down and, if, and you can just envision as you picture it or see it here that Here's this one wall or this one house that's in that city standing up perpendicular. And that was God's promise to Rahab and to her house for hiding the spies there back in Joshua chapter number two. Verse number 21, actually jump over to verse 27. Go all the way over to end of chapter uh, six. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was noised throughout the whole country. So here's Joshua. He's on cloud nine. He's on top of the mountain. And you can kind of see where this is going here. Chapter seven, verse one. This is important. Now picture this. The children of Israel committed a trespass and the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the, the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. I'll look up here for just a minute. Okay. So God just said, he's angry with the children of Israel. They took of the accursed thing, but here's what you need to understand. Okay. Joshua did not know that Achan took this. It was unbeknownst to him. He had no idea that it was taken. And he tells uh, his leaders to go and do something in verse two. Look at Joshua seven and verse two. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is besides Beth Haven on the east side of Bethel and spake unto them saying, go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. Verse three, they returned to Joshua and they said unto him, let not all the people go up, but, but, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai. Watch, watch, you can just sense the tenor in which he says at the end of verse three, and make not all the people go to labor, uh, to labor there uh, thither. For there's just a few. So, so basically he's saying, hey, Joshua, jo hey, we got this. No, no problem. Matter of fact, let most of the army just stay back. We went and spied it out. We got this handled. Okay? Look at verse four. So they did what he said. They went up thither people, about 3,000 men, they fled before the men of Ai, and, and the men of Ai smote them, about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, whereof the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Joshua was completely crushed. The people are absolutely devastated at what took place. And as you keep reading after that verse, Joshua gets on his face and he prays to God and he's laying there before the ark. And as he's praying, look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. L look at what God says to Joshua in verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. I, I under that in my Bible, it's very rarely do you see God saying to somebody who's praying, get up, get off your knees, stop praying. What are you doing? 
He says, Joshua, get up. And by the way, just as a little side note of that, a lot of people use prayer as an alibi to get up and do something for God. So he says, get up, get off your face. Verse 11, don't miss this. Israel hath sinned. Brother Roy, can you just, there's a little echo, if you can turn me down just a touch, I think I might be a little loud. Thank you so much. Verse 11, Israel hath sinned. And they have also trespassed, trespassed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing. Here it's exposed. And they've stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Look up here for just a minute. God says to Joshua, this is what took place. Somebody trespassed, tres- transgressed. I want to see all the tribes. Bring them up. It's got to be exposed of what took place. Look at verse 19. Finally, after this interrogation, verse 19, and Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make a confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Fess up, Achan. Verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. And uh, and then jump over to chapter 8. We'll pray first and then we'll read it. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to look back on on something not only just written thousands of years ago, but Lord, in addition to that, you've said in the New Testament, these things that we're reading in the past were written for us, for our learning and for our admonition. And I pray today that this principle that we see in this passage would resonate in such a way in the hearts of your people that we would look internally and realize what this legendary battle really is. And we'll thank you for it. Pray if there's somebody here not saved today, they'll trust Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' name, and amen. A young man who'd worked for a bank for several years was quite unexpectedly appointed as the president of the bank. He was anxious, and so he approached the chairman of the board, and he said, I'm not sure if if, if I can take this big responsibility of now being thrust into the president of the bank. He says, but I do want to do a good job, but I really want to be successful. He went on to say, I was wondering if you could give me some advice on how to make this bank successful. The old man looked back and he said, yeah, I can give you some advice. It's wrapped up in two words. He says, right decisions. The young man said, well, how do you learn to make right decisions? The old man said, well, you learn that through experience. The young man said, well, how do you get experience that I need? The old man said, by making wrong decisions. (laughs) Henry Ford described a mistake as an opportunity to begin again more intelligently. In our text in Joshua 6 and 7 and 8, we see Joshua leading the children of Israel of, of, by the way, what might be deemed as a bad decision. You remember Israel uh, just came from a miraculous crossing of the Jordan River in Joshua chapter number three, the miracle of the walls following in Joshua chapter number six, and then the disaster that took place in Joshua seven with Achan. So to paint the picture, let's look at what led to the failure of Joshua and the children of Israel. And by the way, by the way, how that relates to us. God says, number one, don't take the spoils. Number two, Achan gave into his desires, into his battle, if you will. And uh, he says, God says, no, no, no. Those are for the treasury. Those were for God. Interesting to note, just kind of 
set this aside, but as a parenthetical here, in the first 10 chapters of the book of Joshua, God led the children of Israel to uh, take 10 different cities. If you know in the Bible, a tenth is a tithe. And for uh, the Jews, they were to, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse number 10, to give a tenth, if you will, a first fruits. So technically, the spoil from one of those cities was to be the Lord's. The spoil from Jericho would have been the Lord's tithe for the next nine cities. What's the moral of the story? When Achan kept the spoil, the tithe, if you will, he was robbing God unto the Lord, into the treasury. Will a man rob God? Wherein if you rob me, he says, in tithes and offerings. Later we see the result of that. And so Achan takes something that did not belong to him. Now here's the, one of the most important points in the message. It didn't just affect him. It affected everybody. Look at chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7 and verse 1 in your Bible. He took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against, what's the last three words of chapter, one, chapter 7, verse 1? The children of who? Well, now you see the picture. The legendary battle, folks, was not with a physical enemy. It was with the flesh. Verse 3 says that the leaders told them to go up and go into battle anyway. And how did that go? They got whooped. Why? Somebody lost a battle. And it wasn't with anybody in uh, Jericho. The battle was with the flesh. So as we think about us today, as we look at this story and we think, okay, Lord, if this was really written for our learning, for our admonition, what do you want us to learn from this today? I would say, number one, all of us are in a battle. There's nobody uh, with the flesh. Nobody in here is exempt from the battle I'm going to talk about today. And the battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with our old nature. It is our propensity to sin. That's why the Bible says in Galatians 5, watch this, everybody has it. If you're saved this morning, say amen. amen. You have the spirit of God living in you, but you still have an Adamic nature. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to another. Listen to me. They don't get along. <laughs> Your flesh wants something and your spirit says another. Our job is to yield to the spirit of God. So what lesson does God teach Joshua and the children of Israel? You know what he did? He sent them right back to the place that they had failed. How do you make good decisions? Experience. You learn from some bad ones. Look at chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse number 1. The Lord said unto Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee. Arise, go up to Ai and see, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. Here we see Israel facing the same city that they faced in chapter seven and got whipped. This little city of Ai, and keep in mind, this is important. Look up here for just a minute. Ai it is a type of the flesh. It means a heap of ruins. But can I just say this? That's a good way to describe the flesh. <laughs> just a heap of ruins. Oh, we try to make it look nice. We do everything that we can to make it look nice. But that's really what it is. It is. Didn't Paul say that, that no good thing dwelleth in me that is in my flesh? Wasn't it uh, Solomon that said, man, listen to this, at his best state is altogether vanity. Isaiah said that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so I don't know the battles that you are fighting with your flesh. I don't know. But I do know this. You can have the victory. Just look quickly, if you would, at your notes. Notice, if you would, a promise that God gave in verse number one. He said, I'll be with you. The Lord speaks to Joshua after the death of Achan. God tells him to go to Ai. However, he tells him, he says, things are going to be different this time. 
He assures him of the victory. It's interesting that the Lord called them to return to the place of their greatest defeat. Do you know many times God will bring you and he'll bring me back to the place of our greatest defeat? Let, let me put it this way. There'll be times in your life that you have, a, you have a fall or you mess up or you, this is, a, this is a, 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 a cord of iniquity. It's a battle that you face. It's a legendary battle. It's a battle with the flesh. Uh, whatever it might be, this is not an overstatement. It's impossible to ever get the victory until you get victory over that. You say, why? Because just like God brought the children of Israel back to Ai, to back to the same place where they had their greatest defeat, God will bring you and he'll bring me back to the place of our greatest battle. Why? Because he wants us to learn what it means to trust him and to get the victory. God knew that they needed to overcome Ai before they could ever move on to the conquest of Canaan. Same for you and me. How many times have you lost the battle to the flesh? How many times have you fallen and you wondered, am I ever going to get back up? How many times has that crossed your mind? He tells Joshua in verse one, fear not. And that's God's word to us today. To those that have fallen and have lost the battle to the flesh, fear not. Hey, a just man falleth seven times but praise God, rises again. Secondly, notice in your notes, if you would, a, a pertinent lesson. Verse two, thou shalt do to Ai and to her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Now watch this, Don't, do not miss this. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Notice the Lord tells them, that they will do to Ai what they did to Jericho, except there's a difference. He says, this time, I want you to know that you can have the spoils. Jericho, don't touch it. It's under the Lord. It's to go into the treasury. Lord, it doesn't make sense to me. He said it. So you do it. Achan didn't do it. Achan got in trouble. Achan was killed. His family was killed. He was stoned. He was burned outside the city as a result of his sin. So don't miss this. Different battle, I'm with you, sin's out of the camp, go ahead and go into AI, and by, 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 by the way, now you can take it, this is for you, you can have it. So, so what's the lesson? Why, 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 what are you harping on that for? If Achan would have waited just a few more days, he could have had all the riches and all the spoils that he could have ever imagined. Let's say that again. If Achan would have waited just a few more days. Some people don't want to wait. The flesh wants what it wants and it wants it now. Stolen waters are sweet. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Instead, he wasn't patient. He took it for himself, that was for what, which was forbidden, and he paid the ultimate price. So what, what is the lesson? We need to learn to wait on God. We have to. You don't want to bring things into your lives that don't need to be there. You wait on God. So what's the problem? It's called a legendary battle. This is what uh, the flesh wants and it wants it now. Have you ever thought about this? The flesh doesn't want to wait. You're, you've just thought about Esau. Esau sold his birthright for some malto meal. And I like malto meal. Have you ever had that stuff? You heat it up and you put a little butter on there and some brown sugar and it's so good. It just warms your body. I love malto meal, but was it worth his birthright? I don't know what it might be for you today a material purchase that we can't say no to, a marriage, don't be hasty and later regret. Can I, I always say this on the financial side, I believe this, 
Slow and steady wins the race. The scriptures remind us to wait on the Lord. Psalm 37 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him. And guess what? He will bring it to pass. <laughs> Just wait on him. Thirdly, notice in your notes, if you would, I told you these were quick, a prescription for victory. God, if your doctor gives you a prescription, generally you're going to be like, you're not going to like it, I ain't going to do this. God in heaven, your creator, gave you a prescription of how to get the victory over AI, which is a type of the flesh. We can't look at it and go just crumple it up and throw it away. We've got to listen to it. Or, or it's pretty simple. He ain't going to force himself on you. You live in defeat. You have defeat. Look at chapter 8, verse 3. Here's the, here's the prescription. Okay, go up against AI. Choose out 30,000 mighty men of valor. Send them away by night. Just told, told him specifically what to do. He gave him a detailed attack. It was the tactical plan of what to do and how it was going to take place. When you fight the battle by following God's plan, you cannot fail. When you fight the battle, your battle, my battle, when you do it your way, every single time you'll end up in the ditch. If you prefer to get the victory, we have to follow his prescription. So God tells Joshua, whoa. What do you want me to do? Or, or just Joshua asks, what do you want me to do? And God tells him exactly what to do, and he gets the total victory. The question is, what are we to do if we want the victory over our AI, our flesh? What are some of the legendary battles that you face? Does, it may be covetousness. It might be laziness. Responding to somebody the wrong way, overindulgence, a temptation to lower your standards, a battle of unbelief, a battle of lust, a battle of not being able to stop murmuring and complaining. Everybody has a different battle, a different uh, proclivity to a certain thing. What might be, I said Thursday night in our message on Thursday night in the armor of God, what might be your battle is not my battle. And what might be my battle is not your battle. We all have our own vices, our own predispositions, our own proclivities. Those are real. But whatever it is, you can't give in to it. You have to yield to God to get the victory. Can I teach you one truth that no matter what, no matter what, one truth in this point on the prescription. If you, got it, if you didn't get anything, get this, as preachers always say. No matter what it is that you might struggle with, that I might struggle with, if you give in to this legendary battle of the flesh, if you give in to it, never will there be a time where you're better off or you're happier. It never. It's always the opposite. If there's something you're battling with, whatever it might be, you give in. And you, it's like gravel in the mouth. I'm going to show you a verse in Psalms. I, I've preached and inferred this just in preaching and in passing before. But I want you to notice in Psalm 106, at the end of it, just for time, I won't read the whole thing. Verse 12, 13, speaking of Israel, God did a great victory. And it says in Psalm 106, the guys will have it on the screen behind me, verse 13. After God did these great things, they forgot his works. They didn't wait for his counsel. Watch this. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And here it is. Here it is. Here's the lesson. You have heard this before. Well, we all needed to hear it again. They wanted something. They wanted it so bad. And God gave it to them. God gave it to them but he sent leanness to their soul. Leanness. Do, do you think it's worth it? Well, you're gonna get this one thing that you really wanted, that your fresh flesh really wanted, but then inside there's an emptiness and a leanness. I'm saying to open door today, it is not worth it. Yield to the Spirit of God. And that does not mean that you can't have nice things or do something nice or go there or do it. That isn't it, just make sure it's of the Lord. And make sure it's not of the flesh. Bread of deceit is sweet to a man. But afterwards, his mouth is filled with gravel. Years ago, I preached a message uh, like 15 years ago. And I had 
I asked anybody in the congregation if, if they were on a diet. Somebody said, yeah, I'm on a diet. I said, well, come on up here. And I put this maple bar, which by the way is the best donut ever made. It's a maple bar. And I said, he's, I can't have that. And I said, man, look at this thing. I could microwave it just a little if you wanted, you know, and we're, I said, just, just take a bite. Just take one bite. So he took a little bite. I said, man, that's good. Took another bite. So just for the illustration, I gave him a little teeny handful of gravel. And I gave it to him. I said, now have a little of this. He's like, what are you talking about? And I had him look at Proverbs 20, verse 17. Bread is, of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards the mouth is filled with gravel. You may get what you want, but God's going to send leanness to your soul. What are you saying, preacher? It is never worth it. It's never worth it. And by the way, God won't force himself on you. Did, you. did you know you can make anything happen? You can plow through and make it happen? 100%. You can give in to the battle and get exactly what you want. But lean this to your soul. Years ago, and I say years ago, this would have been roughly 30 years ago, maybe a little longer. Uh, Mary and I were dating at the time. And I was going to buy a Jeep. I wanted this Jeep really bad. I kept looking, looking, looking. When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is conceived, it brought forth this red Jeep. It was amazing. <laughs> it was really cool. I wanted it so bad. And so I went to the place. I finally found the one I want, Brother Kurt. And I went in. And sure enough, the guy that was the loan officer, I went to high school with. He's like, we got this, you know? So he called, I went home and he called me. And I was feeling like I wanted this so bad, but I felt like the Lord didn't want me to have it. This is not the right time. Uh, just, just knew that it wasn't God's will, but I wanted it so bad. And I remember just struggling and battling inside to buy this Jeep. And he called me and said, Hey, we got a good rate. You're approved for the loan, such and such down. No problem. Pick it up today. And I got physically sick over the, my, the battle on the inside. If you had a Jeep, praise God. I just know God was telling me I couldn't have it, right? So I'm, I'm planting a seed because I'm thinking about getting one next year, but no, I'm not. <laughs> just kidding. I didn't do it. And you know what? I felt so, now by the way, I know the other feeling because I have given in. I did do it. And then I had leanness on other things, right? And it's not always a purchase. It could be something else stupid, right? If you truly want the victory over a legendary battle, you'll need to follow his prescription. And this is my favorite part of the message is right here. It's got to be some deep, dark secret in there somewhere where I can, got this battle and it's just, I know it's somewhere that God's got it just in the word of God so deep. If I really want to get the battle, it's in there somewhere, Nick, it's there. But Gary, you're looking too, we all want it, Right? Here's your prescription that God gives you and I to have the battle, to get the victory over the battle. He says in Matthew 4, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yeah, I was looking at something a little bit deeper. Oh, oh, well, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Yeah, a little bit more. Uh, man ought always to pray, Brother Rogers, Luke 18, 1, and not to faint. Yeah, a little bit more than that. I was kind of thinking... Uh, you know, something, if I want victory, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I'll help you get the victory. Well, you know, is there anything deeper? Yeah, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all the stand, stand. Yeah, is there anything else? It's so simple, it's painful. And yeah, I, I'm trying to squeeze everything I can out of those verses. Two, really, and, they, and you get criticism sometimes if it's like, well, I know that, I know that, I know that. I heard a story about a, a, a restaurant owner, and he owned this restaurant, and he had, Mike, this thing that anybody that would come into the restaurant that could squeeze more lemon out of the lemon than the owner of the restaurant, then they would get a free meal. <laughs> it was a, a, actually, it was in a farming community and right next to a truck stop. Guys would come in, the farmers, the truck, truckers would come in, get a free meal, give me a lemon. The restaurant owner would grab a lemon. They'd squeeze that in and he'd look at it and they'd fill that cup and he'd take that lemon and squeeze it. And every single time, Paul, there was more 
in that lemon, uh, in, that, in that cup for this restaurant owner than any of the big guys. Nobody could beat them. One particular day, this guy walks in. He's about 120 pounds. He says, I heard you guys got a deal that if you squeeze more lemon into the cup than the restaurant owner, you get a free meal. So that's true. He goes, I want to try it. Everybody gets around, the farmers, the truckers, they're all watching, and store owner goes first, and he squeezes that lemon into the cup. Man, it just, it starts feeling, the guy's like, look, this is the guy. This little 120-pound guy grabs the lemon and just goes, <laughs> and just fill that entire cup up and beat the restaurant owner. Everyone's like, wow, he's a, what a buck. He goes to sit down, get his free meal, and the restaurant owner comes up to him, and he says, Man, that was amazing. How'd you do that? He goes, I don't know. He said, well, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> I'm trying to squeeze everything I can out of these verses. <laughs> Follow the prescription. We're, gonna, we're just about done, but I want you to see verse 18 in chapter 8. Look at verse 18, a present power. The Lord said unto Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai. For I'll give it in thy hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear and he had in his hand toward the city. Israel fought the battle, but God gave him the victory. See, the first time Israel went to Ai, they went up in their own power. And they lost 36 people died. The next time they went up, they went up in the power of God. And God gave them a great victory. You know, it's a reminder to us that the arm of flesh will fail us every single time. Do not trust in yourself, but in the living God. It doesn't matter what it is. When people say to you, you know, I'm really trying to get this uh, you know, I'm applying to this school, or I'm trying to get this job, or I've got this thing over here that I'm trying to get the, vi and, and, and you have to understand, whatever the issue is, and again, we have to just remember it, like, I'm making some decisions right now, and I'm meeting with Pastor Kennedy and staff, we're doing certain things, and I just said, well, if this is God's will, it's going to work out. If not, it wasn't God's will. And when you develop that mindset and you trust God that no matter what, we can't force it to happen. It has to be God. Man, it's liberating. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I've been meditating on that verse for some time. And then lastly, as we close, look at chapter 8 and verse 30. We see a permanent burial. A permanent burial. Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. I won't teach the whole thing, but it was interesting when it was all said and done that there was a valley and one was on this side and one was on this side. Ai was on this side and Bethel was on this side and Bethel was a type of the house of the Lord and Ai is a type of the flesh and one stood on this side and one stood on this side. If you read the whole end of chapter eight, that they would read the law out and one, they would read from one side and read to the other, They'd read the blessings and read the cursings and they would say amen and amen. What they were trying to do have a memorial, have a burial, settle the thing once for all, and build an altar unto the Lord. An altar is where you have a sacrifice. Joshua knew that his enemy had to be totally eradicated or there would be a problem down the road. I'm saying to you today, we're, never, we're always gonna have our Adamic nature in us, but did you know after time, like I used to have things I struggled with 30 years ago. I don't struggle with anymore because by the grace of God, I have the victory over them, the victory. And by the way, if you are having a struggle and you've got something you're struggling with, if you're sitting here today, like I, I'm trying to stop smoking, well, don't have a pack sitting in your drawer waiting for you. I'm trying to stop drinking, got a cold one in the fridge just waiting for me, right? You just don't put it around, flee from all appearances of evil in addition to not putting yourself in a precarious situation. If you want to, you got to give it a burial, get the victory. 
You know, your flesh is not saved. Your flesh is not holy. We need to understand some things about our flesh if we're going to have the victory. It's alive and it's at war with the spirit of God. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary one to another. So when should you give your flesh a decent burial? Today. When should you give your flesh a decent burial? Tomorrow. Moment by moment. It must die daily. And thankfully, church family, I'm done. Thankfully, there's going to come a time. Did I say that a couple times? Well, I know I said that, but I'm done. Thankfully, there's going to be a day when we no longer have to battle the flesh anymore. Amen. What a blessing. <laughs> and by the way, if you are backslidden and you're not living right and you don't really care and you're in a battle in the flesh, you're like, I don't even know what this battle is. That's because you've given in completely and you've silenced the conviction of the Holy Spirit and your conscience is seared and you're living in sin and pretty soon God's going to deal with you as he did with Achan. It may not be that, but it'll be something else because God rules in the affairs of men, period. Do right do right and do right until the stars fall from their silvery sockets. Do right. The songwriter said, there's going to be a day when this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise and cease the everlasting skies. And finally, we can say, farewell, farewell. Sweet hour of prayer. And I'll add to that song and say, farewell to this flesh. One day the battle's gone forever. Until then, we're in a legendary battle, bigger than anything that happens in Las Vegas later this afternoon. The question is, who will win, AI or God Almighty? The answer, the one you feed the most. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time and thank you for your word. And I pray that you'll use this message to be a help to somebody I pray if there's somebody here today not saved, that they'll trust Christ as their Savior. How many of you with the uplifted hand would say today, Pastor Murphy, I know I'm saved. If I died today, I know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you slip your hand up? I know I'm saved. How many of you would say, I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure I'm saved. But if you could know it, I'd like to know it. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't know heaven is my home. God spoke to me today and showed me my need for salvation. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the professions of faith in here today. Just by the show of hands, people say, I'm saved. And my, my response to that is, praise God. Now help us all to battle our flesh in your power and in your strength. We'll thank you for it and give you the glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.